Okay, welcome everyone. It is now 10 after 10 and I'd like to start on time to make sure that we have enough time perhaps to leave questions for the very end. My name is Professor Carolyn Dudek. I'm Professor and Chair of the Political Science Department and I would like to welcome all of you to this uh, part of our series of lecture leading up to the presidential election. Um, we've had a whole series of talks, poli-sci talks as political science talks, as well as um, talks related to a poll that is being done by Hofstra University under the direction of Professor Mina Bose. And I do think <laughs> Professor Bose is also on this meeting. I wanna thank her very much for helping to coordinate this series of talks. The next talk that's going to be happening, that's going to be the last snapshot of the Calico poll will be on November 2nd. So please stay tuned for that event, um, which will be very telling as we move into the actual election date of November 3rd. I'd also like to thank the Cultural Center for all of their assistance in putting together this event, both Johanna Farrell and Carol Mallison. Thank you so much for your assistance. And I'd also like to thank Dean Rifkin for always promoting and supporting these kinds of events. <coughs> Without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker today, professor and former Dean of the Hofstra College of Arts and Sciences, Bernard Firestone. Professor Firestone is an expert in international affairs and US <clears throat> foreign relations. He recently published an article entitled The Removal of UNEF, which is the UN Emergency Force and the Limits of UN Diplomacy that came out last year in the Journal of Diplomatic History. He has been our Dean for 20 years and our beloved Dean for 20 years of the Hofstra College of Arts and Sciences. We as a Department of Political Science are so pleased to have him back in the department and as one of our colleagues. And so without further ado, Professor Firestone. Thanks very much, Carolyn. You know, I was originally scheduled to give this talk in March, uh, but then COVID hit and the university shut down. Uh, had I been tasked with discussing a topic like the economy in the election or race in the election or packing the court in the election, I might have been forced to write a new talk. But happily, what was true then about foreign policy is true now. So what is that truth? Let me rely on an observation made not by a political scientist, but rather by a professional politician 60 years ago. During the 1960 Republican convention in Chicago, Illinois Governor William Stratton, who is to the right of this picture, just to the left of Richard Nixon, uh, advised Richard Nixon about the vice presidential nomination that he had to make. Stratton said, you can say all you want about foreign policy, but what is really important is the price of hogs in Chicago and St. Louis. Stratton was simply expressing the conventional wisdom that foreign policy can't compete for the public's attention with bread and butter issues. A piece of wisdom repeated several decades later when James Carville, a strategist in Bill Clinton's first presidential campaign, paraphrased Stratton with the since off mimicked words, it's the economy, stupid. So does this mean that foreign policy is never important in an election? It's not easy to address this proposition, although political scientists have tried. Uh, it, it, electoral tabulations do not break down each person's vote on the basis of issue salience. So it's impossible to know simply by looking at the vote, why the voter voted the way she did. So instead, political scientists who have studied the issue have examined poll results, specifically surveys that ask respondents to rank their issues of concern. If you look at this slide, you see a Pew Research Center survey from uh, August of this year that lists the most important issues for voters in this election. Not surprisingly, the economy stands at the top and healthcare right behind. You have to go down to about the middle of this list of issues that voters are interested in to come across foreign policy. Uh, whereas 79% of the public believes that the economy is the most important issue, 
only about 57% believe that foreign policy is the issue. In addition to this, the first debate this year did not have a single question on foreign policy. National security is scheduled to be the fifth of six topics that are supposed to be discussed this Thursday night, but who knows if they'll ever get that far. And since this poll was taken, more has happened to crowd out foreign policy. What with a pandemic, racial unrest, economic distress, and a controversial Supreme Court nominations, there's really not much room for foreign policy in the voter's mind. On the other hand, notwithstanding their marginal impact on voting, foreign policy issues can take center stage in presidential election contests, although they have not this year. For one thing, candidates frequently stake out different positions on foreign policy during a campaign either because they have genuine policy differences or because it is politically expedient for candidates to use their adversary's foreign policy record or position against them. Let me give you three examples. In 1960, we had a presidential race between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. 1960 was the height of the Cold War. There was great anxiety in the United States about American security just three years before the Soviet Union was the first country to launch a man-made satellite into space. President Kennedy during this campaign, and remember Richard Nixon was vice president to Dwight Eisenhower, claimed that the United States had lost its edge to the Soviet Union. He argued very strenuously that there was a missile gap between the Soviet Union and the United States and that the United States was on the short end of that missile gap. He made this indictment of the Eisenhower administration's foreign policy an important part of his campaign. Although once he became president, he found out that he was completely wrong about this and that if there was a missile gap, it was the other way. So we can see that foreign policy can play a role in a presidential election. If we move forward 12 years to 1972, the person you see on this slide is George McGovern, a senator from South Dakota. George McGovern was the Democratic candidate for president. Uh, he was a progressive. Uh, and as a progressive, he made his case primarily about the Vietnam War. And in addition to that, one of his slogans during the election was come home America, which means Let's stop fighting wars abroad and let's deal with the problems we have at home. The Nixon administration understood that there, or pardon me, the Nixon campaign understood that there were a lot of people who weren't happy with uh, George McGovern's defense policy, including people who identified as Democrats. And as a consequence, they sought to capitalize on this unhappiness with the following ad. The McGovern defense plan it would cut the Marines by one third, the Air Force by one third, it would cut Navy personnel by one fourth, it would cut interceptor planes by one half, the Navy fleet by one half, and carriers from 16 to 6. Senator Hubert Humphrey had this to say about the McGovern proposal. It isn't just cutting into the fat. It isn't just cutting into manpower. It's cutting into the very security of this country. President Nixon doesn't believe we should play games with our national security. He believes in a strong America to negotiate for peace from strength. We move forward to 2004, and there were actually two major foreign policy issues during that campaign. One was terrorism, as you can see from this picture on the left, and the other was the war in Iraq, which by 2004 was already going very, very badly. Although Howard Dean, a governor from Vermont, did not win the nomination, he made a very good showing during the primaries 
primarily on the basis of his criticisms of the war in Iraq. I read a study by a political scientist <clears throat> about the issue of foreign policy and elections who showed that for voters who believed that terrorism was the most important issue, Bush gained their support. And for those who believed that the Iraq war was the major issue, it was Kerry who gained their support. So frequently, well, not frequently, but occasionally, foreign policy can capture the public's attention and become an issue in a presidential election. There's a second way in which foreign policy can play a role in an election. <clears throat> Presidents hold a singular responsibility, and that is control over the decision to use nuclear weapons. No single domestic issue carries as much weight. Sometimes candidates will raise the issue of their opponent's fitness for office by referencing the nuclear issue. Two examples. First, the Daisy ad from 1964. This was an ad produced by the Democratic Party against Barry Goldwater, the Republican candidate for president, who during the campaign had made some reference to the possible use of tactical nuclear weapons to end the war in Vietnam. This ad was considered so incendiary that after it was shown once, it had to be pulled, but the message was clear. on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. The message of this ad was unmistakable. If you value the life of this little girl, you will vote for Lyndon Johnson in the election. 52 years later, Hillary Clinton borrowed a page from the Daisy commercial. I spent many years as a nuclear missile launch officer. If the president gave the order we had to launch the missiles, that would be it. I prayed that call would never come. Self-control may be all that keeps these missiles from firing. I would bomb the shit out of them. I want to be unpredictable. I love war. The thought of Donald Trump with nuclear weapons scares me to death. It should scare everyone. I'm Hillary Clinton, and I approve this message. There's a third way in which elections uh, or foreign policy can play a role in elections. And that is the case where the October surprise rears its head. The October surprise is a decision or event frequently orchestrated by the incumbent that occurs near an election to influence the election outcome. Well, an October surprise can involve a domestic event, such as the mysterious discovery of a hard drive belonging to the son of your opponent or the indictment of your political adversaries. It is foreign policy that more easily lends itself to presidential manipulation. For example, it is unlikely that President Trump will produce a coronavirus bailout so close to the election because the issue requires congressional action and Congress is tied up in partisan knots. Foreign policy, on the other hand, allows the president more latitude to act unilaterally. The president can most often act without Congress. The classic case for foreign policy serving as an October surprise was LBJ's decision in October 1968 to halt the bombing of North Vietnam and begin negotiations to end the war. Much as he was unhappy with his own vice president, Hubert Humphrey, the Democratic candidate, for finally distancing himself from Johnson's war policies, Johnson hated Nixon and did not want him to succeed him. 
So with Humphrey closing the gap with Nixon in the final days of the race, Johnson announced his decision, the decision to end or terminate the bombing of Vietnam and begin talks. But it would require the acquiescence of South Vietnamese President Thieu to convene the talks. At this point, a person named Anna Chenault, a Republican operative and hardline member of what was known as the rigidly anti-communist China lobby, intervened to persuade Chu not to participate in the talks. LVJ was livid and accused Nixon of treason. But Nixon, in a phone call with Johnson, said, and I quote, any rumbling around about somebody trying to sabotage the Saigon government's attitude certainly has no credibility as far as I'm concerned. Many years later, the Nixon Library released the document you see on your left, notes written by Nixon assistant H.R. Haldeman of a phone conversation with Nixon on October 22nd, two weeks before the election. Note the words near the bottom, keep Anna Chenault working on SVN, meaning the government of South Vietnam. This was the classic October surprise. Will President Trump pull a foreign policy rabbit out of a hat? Could it be another Arab country, such as Sudan, signing a peace accord with Israel? An extension of the nuclear arms agreement with Russia? Or could it be a war with Iran? Who knows? Nor, in an era of massive early voting, does anyone know whether the October surprise carries the same weight as it used to? Of course, there are those who argue that who gets elected as president doesn't matter as much in foreign policy as it does in domestic policy. First, there has been since the end of World War II a general bipartisan consensus about America's role in the world. Thus, Democrat or Republican, all presidents pursued the policy of containment during the Cold War and continued international engagement when the Cold War ended. The differences of opinion between Democrats and Republicans on foreign policy pale in comparison with differences over domestic issues such as abortion, race, tax policy, health care, etc. So the transition to a new president, many argue, may produce more continuity than change in the nation's foreign policy. Second, a president may run on a certain foreign policy platform. But once a candidate becomes president, international events can overtake ideology. When Ronald Reagan was running for president of the United States, he defined himself as a strong anti-communist. He was opposed to detente. He was opposed to arms control agreements. But several years after he became president, a reformist leader came to power in the Soviet Union. His name was Mikhail Gorbachev. And Ronald Reagan, this staunch anti-communist, became known for signing a disarmament agreement with the Soviet Union in 1987. When George Bush was running for president in 2000, he reacted negatively to uh, Bill Clinton's foreign policy, which involved military involvement by the United States abroad for humanitarian reasons in Haiti, in the Balkans, in Somalia, and he said that as president, he would pursue a more modest foreign policy. Several years later, he invaded Afghanistan and then Iran, and then promoted a movement or promoted a policy to spread democracy across the Middle East. So the argument often is made that what a candidate says about foreign policy when he or she is running for office can be very different from the realities that person faces once that person is president. But that notion that it really doesn't matter all that much who gets elected president uh, has been shattered by the Trump presidency. Because as this cartoon shows, who is president does matter. What has Trump done since he became president? Well, first, he has acted aggressively to dismantle President Obama's policy legacy. 
We know about his single-minded determination to end the ACA and his rollback of a slew of environmental regulations. But foreign policy has not escaped his acts. The president, the president has withdrawn from two agreements that President Obama entered into. One is the Trans-Pacific Partnership or TPP, and the other is the Paris Climate Accord. In addition to that, President Trump has withdrawn from perhaps the signal achievement of Obama's foreign policy, and that is the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or JCPOA, a multilateral agreement designed to curb the Iranian nuclear program. So the president has clearly turned his back on policies that his immediate predecessor had uh, embraced. But it's not only Obama who has been the target of uh, President Trump's foreign policy. Instead, the president has gone about reversing decades of bipartisan foreign policies. The president has expressed uh, great opposition to American trade policy, a trade policy that has been carried on both through Democratic and Republican administrations. He ran in opposition to NAFTA and essentially browbeat Mexico and Canada into accepting a revised agreement. But he initiated trade wars around the world, not only with adversaries, but also with friends. He redefined America's conception of friends and enemies. We all know about President Trump's relationship with President Putin of Russia. But if you look at this almost iconic picture on the left, you see President Trump along with a number of Western leaders. What they're talking about is not entirely clear, but it looks as if Angela Merkel is trying to get Trump to drink his milk while his siblings are looking on in horror at this confrontation. In other words, the president has defined people who were or countries that were previously viewed as adversaries as friends and countries that were previously viewed as friends as adversaries. So the question is, and in the Middle East, let me add one other thing. The president has undone several decades of, uh, of um, Amer the American view of the Middle East conflict between Arabs and Israelis. Uh, the, the paradigm that has existed at least since Jimmy Carter's time and embraced by a succession of presidents was a solution to the Arab-Israeli conflict was to deal with the Palestinian issue first. And as a consequence of that, Arab countries would join in peace with Israel. But President Trump has turned that on its side and instead has engineered agreements between Israel and at least two Arab countries, two Gulf countries, while leaving the Palestinian issue uh, unresolved. These are major changes in American foreign policy, not just changes from Obama, but changes from decade, as I said, of bipartisan American foreign policy. So what animates Trump? What, what, what is the substance of his foreign policy? What defines his foreign policy? You know, most presidents enter, enter the, the White House with a belief system about the world and America's role in that world. Nixon, for example, was a political realist who, who believed that he could triangulate the relationship among the United States, the Soviet Union, and China to create a balance of power that would be in America's interest. Carter believed very strongly in human rights and tried to reorient American foreign policy away from a balance of power conception of the world to one that emphasizes human rights. Reagan came to the presidency, as we said before, opposed to detente and determined to, uh, to have a hard line against the Soviet Union. And he even proposed uh, um, moving away from deterrence as a way of ensuring American nuclear security and instead moving toward something he called the SDI or Strategic Defense Initiative, meaning 
a defensive system for protecting the United States against nuclear weapons. So all of these presidents came to the presidency with a definite idea about where America stood in the world and how it could establish its security in that world. So what is Trump's global philosophy? Well, perhaps it's a reversion to pre-World War II isolationism, the kind that kept the United States out of the League of Nations, that enacted a punishing and ultimately self-defeating tariff known as the Smoot-Hawley tariff, and turned its back on monstrous human rights abuses in Asia and Europe that were evolving in the 1930s. But it's important to note that Trump's isolationism is different. The isolationism of the 30s followed logically from 150 years of American history in which the avoidance of foreign entanglements, except for World War I, was the norm. Trump's policies, on the other hand, follow 75 years of active American political and military engagement with the world. Instead of trying to maintain a policy of isolation against the realities of a changing world, as the pre-World War II isolationist attempted and ultimately failed to do so, Trump is trying to deconstruct the architecture of America's global involvement. Whether he succeeds remains to be seen. So while it is tempting to uh, attribute a coherent view to Trump's foreign policy, I think it is more accurate to uh, characterize his foreign policy as largely visceral rather than intellectual. In Trump's world, one no doubt honed in the arena of New York City real estate development and Atlantic City casinos. The world is divided into winners and losers. And what constitutes a loser is clear. A loser is someone who is consistently taken advantage of. In Trump's view of recent American history, his predecessors as president, and not just Obama, presided over America's decline by allowing others adversaries, trading partners, and even allies to take advantage of our goodwill, immense wealth, and military superiority. Trump's antidote is America first, a foreign policy that will end America's role as the world's patsy, as the world's slightly addled rich uncle. And this leads to what many commentators have called a transactional way of evaluating American interests. In Trump's universe, allies are defined not by shared values or conversion interests, but by how much they pay for their own defense. Economic relationships are evaluated not by their contributions to American prosperity, but by the size of the trade deficits they generate. Security is measured by how much the U.S. spends on defense relative to others, but is otherwise untethered from any coherent vision about America's place in the world and hence the role of its military power. Soft power and the promotion of human rights are ignored because they do not lend themselves to commodification. International institutions and multilateral agreements are dismissed as vehicles for other nations to take further advantage of the United States. And this is pretty much what Trump said in his inaugural address. He has delivered on what he said. We probably all remember this address in which he said, I take an oath of allegiance to all Americans. For many, for many decades, we've been rich and rich foreign industry at the expense of the United States. Uh, we've subsidized the armies of other countries while allowing the bad depletion of our own military. We've defended our nation's borders while refusing to defend our own. I believe that this is a visceral reaction to, to how Trump views the world and how America has evolved into, for want of a better term, a sucker that allows others to take advantage of us. Now, apart from policy, Trump has, has had two other notable effects on American foreign policy. First of all, he has been at war with the foreign policy establishment and the institutions of his own government. 
To be fair, other presidents have expressed frustration with their own bureaucracy. JFK was furious with the CIA after the Bay of Pigs invasion. Nixon was so distrustful of the State Department that he essentially put foreign policy in the hands of his national security advisor, Henry Kissinger. Obama was extremely upset with the military when he was considering whether to engage in a surge in Afghanistan. And Eisenhower, in his famously well-known farewell address, warned against the military-industrial complex. But what makes Trump's case different is that his indictment of the nation's foreign policy institutions, from the State Department to the intelligence agencies to the military leadership, is part of a larger conspiracy theory about the deep state and its undermining of his leadership. And he has had no qualms about pressing this conspiracy theory publicly. Trump, moreover, has shown no respect, in fact, contempt for the advice of foreign policy professionals. He said early in his administration, and I quote, rather than surround myself with those who have perfect res resumes, but very little to brag about except for a long history of failed policies and continued losses at war, we have to look for new people. And when he's brought in professionals, they have cycled through as through a revolving door, inevitably to write a memoir filled with disdain and horrifying tales of the president's alleged malfeasance. We may think of last year's impeachment drama as a conflict between Trump and congressional Democrats, but it was just as powerful in demonstrating the gulf between Trump and the foreign policy establishment who bridled at Trump's conflation of national security concerns with his own electoral interest. So this is one way in which uh, Trump has, has not just changed foreign policy, but the landscape in which foreign policy is made. There's another thing he's done, which is really quite extraordinary. And that is to reverse years of Republican orthodoxy on foreign policy issues. If you look at this list uh, where people are asked, this is again, the Pew Research Center, the percentage who say each is a major threat to the well-being of the United States. Well, it's not surprising to see that Democrats believe that global climate change is a major threat and Republicans do not. But if you look at Russia's power and influence, it is, it is the Republicans who were always the hardline party. But probably in response to Trump's uh, relationship with Vladimir Putin, it is 65% of Democrats who view Russia as a major threat and only 35% of Republicans. Here's an even starker difference, the issue of tariffs. We know that President Trump has, uh, has uh, increased tariffs on a large number of nations including friendly nations. The Republican Party has been the party of free trade because it is good for American business, and the Democratic Party has traditionally been the party against free trade because of its impact on the American worker. But look at this result, again, from the Pew Research Center. Are higher tariffs good for the United States? Republicans, 70% say yes. Democrats, 14% say yes. So what Trump has succeeded in doing is in really changing Republican orthodoxy about major foreign policy issues. Now, here's a case, support for cooperation by party. This is a more recent poll. And here the question is, is it good for the United States to collaborate with other countries in global efforts? And you can see here, coordinate and collaborate with other countries to solve global issues, Democrats by 80% say yes, Republicans only by 40%. This aversion to global institutions is, uh, it, it really predates Trump and has, has been a position of the Republican Party for a number of years. So what happens if Trump is reelected? What happens to foreign policy? Will we decouple from China as his trade advisor Navarro would like to do? In other words, let's completely decouple our economy from the Chinese economy? 
Will he end sanctions on Russia, which he probably would like to do because of his relationship with Putin? Will he get out of NATO because of his contempt for our Western European allies? Well, let me just say that while he may want to do some of these things, moving the government, as much as we've talked about how uh, President Trump has, has, uh, has shattered certain orthodoxies of American foreign policy, moving the government is much harder than it appears. The fact is for all of Trump's talk, we still have thousands of troops around the globe. US troops, thousands of US troops are still in Europe, Asia and the Middle East and Africa. And far from disengaging from Europe, we have actually stepped up our preparedness in Europe, sent more troops for a possible conflict with Iran to the Middle East and beefed up our alliances in Asia. Military leaders, when they, when they read a tweet from President Trump that he wants to remove troops from Afghanistan or from Syria, simply ignore what he says, arguing that a tweet is not an official command. Despite his relations with Kim Jong-un and Vladimir Putin, there are still sanctions on Russia and North Korea. Decoupling from China, our trade deficit with China is bigger than it's ever been. So it's true that, that Trump has had a major impact upon American foreign policy. But at the same time, uh, he, has, he has found it more difficult on the ground to bring about fundamental changes that he might otherwise prefer. And if he is reelected, he may still have difficulties trying to achieve those ends. Now, what about Joe Biden? What would happen if Biden was elected? And I want to thank my students in American foreign policy who wrote papers, submitted papers earlier this month about what would happen if Joe Biden were president. What I was really trying to do was to get you to write this lecture for me. So thank you. Now, in the case of Biden, he's very different from Donald Trump, obviously. First of all, he would come to the presidency with significant foreign policy experience. He's been in the Senate since 1972, I believe. So he has long experience in the Senate. He was the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. And then as vice president, he was given significant responsibilities on foreign policy by President uh, Obama. Uh, in addition to that, he's put together a foreign policy team that has previous foreign policy experience, many of them having worked in the Obama administration. This to the person to the right here is Tony Blinken who was Deputy National Security Advisor and Deputy Secretary of State during the Obama administration. And uh, he is very close to, to Biden and probably his top advisor. While it's true, and, and this was driven home quite a bit during the primaries, that Biden supported the war in Iraq, uh, he also opposed the surge in Afghanistan when he was vice president to President Obama. And he opposed the uh, air attacks upon, um, upon the air force of Muammar Gaddafi in Libya that led to Gaddafi's downfall. So he has a mixed record in terms of whether American military force should be used abroad. But one thing to understand about Biden, and here he's somewhat similar to Trump. Trump believes very strongly in his personal abilities to negotiate with leaders. Biden feels the same way. Biden has developed a relationship, for, for example, as vice president with the president of China, Xi. And as, um, as his vice presidential candidate said during the vice presidential debate, foreign policy is about relationships. And Biden certain belie certainly believes that relationships are important, just as Trump believes that relationships are important in foreign policy. So what will he do? You know, I've been reading a lot recently in professional journals about, about a Biden foreign policy. And the big question out there is, can any new president repair all the damage that Trump has done? Now, obviously not everyone believes that Trump has done damage, but the fact is that there are people who believe that. And the question is, can Biden undo what Trump did? Well, let's talk about things he can do. 
First of all, there's what I would call the low hanging fruit, things that he will definitely do and probably pretty early on in his administration. I'm certain he would rejoin the Paris Climate Accord. He would rejoin the World Health Organization that Trump recently withdrew from. He has already said that the START agreement, the Strategic Arms Reduction Agreement between the United States and Russia, which is set to expire in February, should be renewed for another five years as it is being renegotiated. In addition to that, Biden will no doubt try to restore American soft power, to restore America's image around the globe. And that will start with repairing relations with allied nations. I expect him to visit Europe very early and probably like many other presidents other than Donald Trump to visit Canada very early as well. Next in line, I wouldn't call this low hanging fruit, but things that, that Biden would probably do. I think Biden will go along with the Trump foreign policy that China is an adversary that has to be confronted there is now a bipartisan consensus about future relations between China and the United States. There is a sense that China has cheated on its agreements under the World Trade Organization, that it is behaving aggressively in the South China Sea to the uh, detriment of American allies and to the detriment of the United States. But was probably what will be different about Biden is that he will seek to create a coalition of other states, including West European states, EU states, who are also unhappy with China, and seek to get them together uh, in order to, uh, to uh, confront China. With regard to Iran, he is likely to rejoin the JCPOA, uh, and he's likely to do so probably because he believes that, but also because the people he is, uh, who are his foreign policy advisors, including Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan and Wendy Sherman, are people who are very much involved in that negotiation to begin with. So he's likely to do that, but he may also feel that, uh, that it's time to try to renegotiate, to rein in other behaviors of Iran in the Middle East, and perhaps to rein in their missile program. And finally, I expect that he will uh, restart negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians, or at least try to do so. Although he will have to deal with the fact that, um, that the Middle East is different now because of the agreements that Trump has engineered. Now, Biden has to be very, very careful in, in pursuing a foreign policy that is, that is the opposite of Trump's, just as, as Trump uh, constructed a foreign policy that was the opposite of Obama's. The fact is that reckless as Trump may sound, he did address some issues of, of significance. For example, globalization, free trade. Yes, presidents of the United States have supported free trade. Yes, we were the ones who encouraged China to join the WTO. But the fact is that free trade has had an impact and a negative impact upon many Americans, working class Americans, who have left the Democratic Party for the Republican Party. Tr Trump has addressed this issue. What is, what is Biden going to do about it? Will he rejoin the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership? I'm not sure that he'll do it right away. I think he will try to renegotiate because there are Democrats on Capitol Hill who are also concerned about the TPP and how it might affect workers in the United States. The issue of burden sharing. We know that Trump has been browbeating our allies about the fact that they don't pay enough for their defense. Well, they don't. Uh, it was Obama who actually raised the issue several years before. He just did it behind closed doors. So how is how is Biden going to deal with this issue regarding burden sharing? And then, of course, there is the issue of overreach, American overreach militarily. The United States has troops all over the world. We are pledged to support governments in Asia, to support governments in Europe against foreign intervention. The reality is that 
the American people uh, are closer to Trump in some ways on this issue than they are with the Democratic Party or with previous presidents. Now, if you look at this, uh, this uh, survey, views on rejoining international organizations and treaties, most Americans believe that the United States should rejoin the Paris Climate Accord, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the World Health Organization, and so on. But their views on military engagement are different. Look at this question. In general, the US should decrease the number of troops stationed in Europe, Asia, and the Middle East and should reduce its commitment to defend countries in those regions. 44% say yes, only 31% say no. With regard to how to achieve peace, keeping a focus on domestic needs while avoiding unnecessary intervention beyond the borders of the United States, only 35, or pardon me, 35.7% of the public says, yes, that's important. Establishing and encouraging and reinforcing global economic integration, 26%. And look at this next one, promoting and defending democracy around the world. Trump is faulted for the absence of a human rights policy, but only 19% of the public who responded to this said, that the United States role in the world was to spread democracy. Even more striking, as, as Biden seeks to put together an administration, there is a major disconnect between how foreign policy elites, Democrat and Republican, Republican and the public view America's responsibilities to its NATO allies, our most important alliance. The question was, in the case of a Russian attack on a NATO ally, the US should retaliate militarily. When Trump questioned why the United States should protect Montenegro, he was widely derided for, for undermining a fundamental principle of NATO. And that is when one country is attacked, all other countries have responsibility to react. Well, the experts, 95.4%, say that that is the responsibility of the United States. The general public, 54%. Now that's still a majority, but look at the disconnect between what the experts say and what the general public says. So the real question here with Biden, will there be a restoration? Will we go back to the kind of foreign policy that existed before? Yes, involvement in international institutions, but also a large military profile around the world in which we essentially pledge ourselves to protect allies around the world in Europe and Asia? Or is a new paradigm going to develop? And I think it's a new paradigm that's going to be pressed upon him by the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. Move away from military commitments and instead focus on problems of the global commons, such as pandemics, and climate change. Bottom line is this, foreign policy should be a very important issue in a presidential election because who the president is makes a large difference in what the foreign policy of the country will be. But it really doesn't play that kind of role. And that is, is my conclusion to this talk about does it matter? Well, it matters, but it doesn't matter a hell of a lot in a presidential election. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Firestone. Um, can I stop screen share? Uh, yes, uh, let's, okay. I'll stop it. Okay, yes, I think you have to do it. Great. Okay. Um, so what I'd like to do is there are some questions. If you would like to pose a question, if you could please post it in the chat area. I have a couple that were running while you were speaking. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions comes from Emma De Simone, mm -hmm. and she has the question regarding um, Biden and Trump, and that both of them believe in the importance of relationships in foreign policy, but it seems like Trump approaches relationships with foreign governments is a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. as opposed to Biden, who may do this in a different way. Does Biden also believe in a zero-sum approach to relationships, or is it more of a cooperative relationship approach? No, I, I think uh, Emma's correct. Uh, she's in my foreign policy class. She really knows what she's talking about. And, and there's no question that, that, that President Trump uh, views negotiations as zero-sum, meaning 
what I win, you lose, what you win, I lose. And um, don't forget, uh, President Biden has a long experience um, in Congress and in Congress, uh, he negotiated with members of the opposition party. So he understands the importance of compromise. Now, I'm not saying that that approach is a better approach than the zero sum approach. Uh, you know, Pre President Trump has a very strong appreciation for his own abilities as a negotiator. Um, and in addition to that, um, and, and it's impo impossible to ignore this, he very much wants the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> He's working hard to achieve it. The other day he was in Iowa where uh, th there had just been some very, very nasty weather. And he complained that the papers were spending too much time uh, thinking or writing about the, the weather calamities that have hit Iowa instead of talking about the fact that he'd just been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. I don't think you can discount this in his efforts to resolve certain what have previously been intractable problems, such as the problem of North Korea, such as the problem of, of, of Middle East peace. Uh, well, you know, presidents have personalities and whatever, whatever it takes to get that president to, um, to um, further the interests of this country, that's all that counts. But I agree with Emma, there is, there is a difference in how they approach negotiations, yes. Thank you. I have another question from, um, I haven't received any other chat. So when you're ready to send a question, please put it through the chat function. Um, by the way, the chat function can be found at the bottom of your screen if you're using a, a laptop, and it can be found at the top of your screen if you're using an iPad or a, a, a touchscreen computer. Um, Emma also has a question about globalization. Mm -hmm. And regarding globalization, it seems that it's, it's pretty irreversible at this point to change globalization. And her question is, should America embrace globalization and try to diversify our economy in order to maintain jobs in the country? Or should America try to isolate itself so the effects of globalization is lessened? Well, I think the, the option of isolation is out of the question. It's out of the question for the very reason that Emma said. Uh, the, the, uh, the cat is out of the bag already with globalization. You, 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 can't, you can't go back. Um, you know, the question is when you're dealing with an economy such as, as China's, which is directed from the top uh, and, and, and where uh, industries are supported by the government. Uh, can the United States or can companies in the United States, um, can they compete fairly with companies, state owned companies or state supported companies in, um, in, in China? And the answer is it's, it's, it's a tough road to, uh, to hope. And the United States has to, to try to equal the playing field somewhat by, um, by reopening the issue of, of, of Chinese trade policies. But probably what we need in this country is some sort of an industrial policy as well. I think we need for the government to, uh, to train people for new kinds of jobs, to engage in infrastructure programs, et cetera, uh, that will, um, that will um, soften the effects of the movement of, of, um, of, of manufacturing from the United States to China and other countries. Thank you, Professor Firestone. So I have another question. Um, it's a question related to the discussion about uh, the United States relationship with Russia. And the question is, are, or is there a suggestion, or are you suggesting that the president take a hard line with Russia and run the risk of strengthening the relationship between Russia and China? Uh, that's a tough one. You know, there, there, there are no clear choices in foreign policy. Look, the relationship between China and Russia is already developed. It even developed before Trump became president because of both countries' uh, concern about America's hyperpower, about the United States having too much power. So, so that's there, but it's a relationship of unequals. Uh, China is much stronger than Russia. And I think Russia understand that there are limits to this relationship. Uh, now, with regard to Russia, you know, no one says that the United States should be in a state of, 
of uh, constant hostility with Russia, or maybe some people are saying that, but the Russians have nuclear weapons. We have to stabilize that relationship. Even during the Cold War, we had detente, we had peaceful coexistence. There was an understanding that it's important to, to, have, to have stable relations with Russia. The question is, does one tolerate Russia seeking to uh, 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 recapture its empire? Uh, th th does, one, does one simply shrug one's shoulders looking at the Russian invasion of Ukraine and say, well, you know, that's the Russian sphere of influence. So there have to be some, some lines, there have to be some lines drawn. But, you know, the United States should uh, establish its own relationships instead of trying to, to tear down relations with, with countries who are otherwise be our friends. And, and that is something a new president would probably seek to do. So I have another question um, regarding the State Department and that early on in the Trump administration that career diplomats had to cope with the fact that the president did not engage or empower the State Department to do his traditional role that foreign officials saw that they could deal directly with the White House. Um, is supporting a more robust State Department another area where a potential Biden administration would make a change? Are there opportunities to improve how American diplomacy is conducted? Well, oh, absolutely. Look, the, the president has contempt, contempt for expert advice. We, we've seen that not only with regard to foreign policy, we've seen it with regard to the pandemic in this country. He, he is not interested in expert advice. For him, an advisor, a good advisor is someone who's going to tell him exactly what he wants to hear, okay? Now, who did he appoint uh, to be the Secretary of State? Rex Tillerson. Now, Tillerson is a businessman, he, uh, but he had significant negotiating experience around the globe. After all, he headed Exxon Mobil, a, a, a major multinational corporation. But uh, his primary interest was in saving money in the State Department uh, and in cutting, cutting the number of people in the State Department. Uh, and in so doing, he demoralized the State Department. When Pompeo first came along, there was, uh, there was actually among some members of the State Department, some staff, uh, a relief that now there was someone whom the president respected, and this may elevate the State Department. But that didn't happen either, uh, because Pompeo has basically, or Pompeo has basically undertaken his own foreign policy. I'm not even sure to what extent uh, Trump is involved in, in Pompeo's foreign policy because he's busy with other things. Uh, Pompeo uh, is, is actively involved, for example, in, um, in, in trying to counter Chinese military and political influence in South Asia. Uh, he, he is very much, very much um, at the head of the, the policy of resisting, or, or maybe not resisting, maybe that's the wrong word, of going after Iran in the Middle East. And he's conducting a very idiosyncratic human rights policy. I said before that this administration doesn't care about human rights. Well, it doesn't care about human rights uh, the way Amer American presidents usually have cared about human rights, and that's democracy, civil liberties, freedom of the press, and so on and so forth. Uh, his, his is rooted in his evangelical uh, uh, position, and he's trying to promote religious liberty around the globe. Uh, and, and, and that has a very, very different kind of, of uh, resonance. So, um, so the State Department remains, um, remains in a state of uh, despair in many ways. And um, I'm convinced that Biden will seek uh, to restore it the State Department to its, its uh, former position. But as I said before, I don't think there's been a president of the United States who hasn't expressed frustration with the State Department now and then. Thank you. I'm gonna just do one last question. Mm -hmm. We're a little over time, but I would like to do one more question. Mm -hmm. um, this is from Professor Bose. Mm -hmm. um, as Vice President, Biden played an important role in foreign policy making while Vice President Pence appears to have a more limited role in foreign policy. How would a Biden-Harris administration incorporate the Vice President in foreign policy, particularly given that Senator Harris's expertise is in law enforcement and domestic policy? 
Well, I think you you answered it, Dr. Bose. Uh, you know, uh, Harris's background is primarily in the, in in the, on the domestic side, uh, and there are many issues here in this country that Harris can address. Uh, and Biden sees himself as a foreign policy expert, and he certainly has significant experience in foreign policy. So uh, I don't see him playing the, I don't see her playing the major foreign policy role uh, that Biden played uh, in the Obama administration. Remember, Obama came to the presidency with little experience in foreign policy, with little experience altogether. I mean, he hadn't been in the Senate for very long before he ran for the president presidency. Uh, Biden has uh, 50 years in the Senate. Uh, a lot of it spent on foreign policy issues. So I think, and, and I think he, he is one who, who um, really uh, sees himself as uh, the expert on foreign policy uh, and, and therefore will, uh, will uh, uh, pretty much take that job for himself. Uh, now, of course, uh, he's never lived down. Uh, Robert Gates, who was Secretary of Defense under Bush and then under Obama uh, during, uh, during the debate over Afghanistan where, uh, and whether there should be a surge. The military was pushing for a surge and, and Gates was pushing for a surge and Biden was against it. Uh, Gates basically said that he's never known an issue on, in foreign policy where Biden was actually correct about something. So that's something that, that that, that says two things. First of all, there are those who don't think Biden has good judgment, but second, uh, that Biden certainly thinks he has good judgment and, and does put in his two cents. Okay. Thank you. So with that, we'll conclude. Thank you so much, Professor Firestone, for sharing your expertise with all of us. I hope that um, this brings a little bit more to the table as we all go to the polls to vote. So get out there and vote. And we'll see you all November 2nd for the Calico Poll uh, findings. Uh, Professor Bose, do you wanna add anything about the Calico Poll event? Oops, I'm sorry, I have to, I have to unmute you. Uh, no, uh, thank you, Dr. Dudek, and thank you, Dr. Firestone, for a very instructive talk. Um, the, the Calico poll results um, are, uh, the survey is underway, and um, we will be uh, releasing them uh, just before the election. So very much hope people will join us uh, for that discussion, and um, there will be uh, some discussion of policy, but it will be uh, primarily election-focused. So having this detailed attention to uh, foreign policy um, is, uh, is most welcome today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bose. Thank you, Professor Firestone. Thanks, everyone, for attending.